a brief moment, Gary Gygax had his company back. And his first act was to hire Lorraine Williams. Lorraine Williams was a trust fund baby, if there ever was one. She was literally part of the Dill family trust. She was a cousin of Flint Dill, Gary's friend from Hollywood. He'd actually recommended her to Gary. She had some experience in business, and Gary wanted her to handle that side of the business for him, while he switched over entirely to focusing on creative work. She attended Berkeley, but not in business and history. She graduated and took a job in her family's newspaper syndicate before moving on to an administrative role in a large hospital. What I'm trying to convey here is that she had more experience than Gary, Kevin, or Brian, but she also was not a time-tested CEO, which is probably what TSR actually needed at this time. But though the board had backed Gary and ousting Kevin, they weren't thrilled to put him in leadership either. He just disastrously spent three years hemorrhaging money in Hollywood, chasing a movie deal with nothing to show for it. Lorraine Williams, though? She was from money. Her family owned the rights to Buck Rogers. Lorraine Williams was the clear pick for the new CEO position as far as the board was concerned. Brian Bloom stepped down from his role in the company after Kevin was ousted. The company tried to buy their shares off of them, but the bank refused to give them the $500,000 to buy the shares at a time when the company was in dire straits financially. The company needed to make money and quick. Fortunately, there was a way to make that happen. Let's finally introduce Kim Mohan. Kim Mohan got his start as a journalist. He worked as both an editorial and sports writer as well as an editor. After doing this from age 20 to 30, he decided to go independent and freelance. During this time, Kim Mohan heard about TSR hiring from a magazine ad in Dragon Magazine. He was a Lake Geneva local and went to TSR Publishing looking for a job. He interviewed with Tim Kask. Kask hired him on the spot. He must have been a dream for TSR. Among a staff of amateurs and hobbyists, here was a man who'd spent 10 years in the newspaper trenches. Newspapers didn't get to come out late. They didn't have the luxury of moving deadlines. He could write fast and well and edit his own writing. He was quickly assigned work on Dragon Magazine, but he was a prolific writer and editor and had his hands in mini pies. Kim Mohan is the only person to have worked on all five editions of the game. He retired just as 5th edition was coming out, but continued to contribute all the way up until 2018. He passed away in 2022 at the age of 73. Alongside him was Jeff Grubb. Jeff Grubb was a Gen Con gamer, and in 1982 he ran D&D Open, a D&D tournament held every year at the event. This got him noticed by TSR, and quickly he was recruited. Jeff Grubb's superpower was being a chameleon of worlds. The skill he'd tap into time and time again in his career at TSR and beyond is the ability to dip into another person's world, figure out what makes it great, and then write something that celebrates that. He'll go on to engineer the Marvel supplement for TSR, and he'll have a lengthy career writing novels in every fantasy setting that could possibly make a nerd jealous. Star Wars, World of Warcraft, Magic the Gathering, Starcraft, Guild Wars, he's written for them all. Jeff Grubb and Kim Mohan take point on developing Unearthed Arcana. The idea for the book was fairly simple. They took work they'd previously published in Dragon Magazine and repackaged it with some editing and some new material to get it out the door as quickly as possible. The idea was simple, but that's exactly what TSR needed. Quick, cheap, and extremely profitable. The hurry production schedule showed, though. This product was full of many mechanical and typographical errors, uncommon for the usually meticulous Kim Mohan, to the extent that they had to take four pages out of Dragon Magazine to print corrections that players could cut out and paste into their books to fix the most egregious errors. But they weren't done yet. Zeb Cook worked hard to get the Oriental Adventures book out the door. This product has not aged well. The idea at the time was to expand D&D into a game which could emulate not just Western fantasy, but also Japanese, Chinese, and Korean fantasy. But just that list already reveals that their scope was too general to be anything other than a shameful caricature. As the D&D fandom gets more diverse and looks more into the past of the game, this book has been broadly panned, and Watsi has even added a disclaimer to the book warning that it does not align with their current values. Research for this book and many like it fell to Jonathan Pickens. Obviously, they should have gotten someone, you know, Asian to work on their supplement about Asia. I mean, probably the first step is to pick one place in Asia and not a region that covers roughly a third of all life on Earth, but hey, I'm just here to tell you what happened. They tapped the research powerhouse John Pickens. As a young man, John was given Blitzkrieg for Christmas one year, which prompted him to get into wargaming. Due to this, he started searching for back issues of Strategy and Tactics magazine. He looked for a seller and eventually found a guy by the name of Gary Gygax. Gary invited him to Gen Con, and after that, Pickens was involved in gaming for life. Pickens applied at TSR for both editor and designer positions. He eventually got hired on as an editor. In his time as editor for TSR, he ended up as the default research guy. 
During production of the al Qadim setting, another setting that has not aged particularly well, Pickens apparently produced three boxes of research material for Jeff Grubb, and even during the production of 2nd edition, he jokes in an article of Dragon Magazine about being known by name at the local library, where he's frequently researching sources for weapon and armor prices in historical time periods. Oh, are we going away from the weight in gold of an object to something <laughs> yeah, a little more? Correct, yes. Um, uh, I also know mm-hmm. that kind of deep dive seems so much fun, though. Mm-hmm. Just like to repeatedly go back, okay, but what did this actually cost? Oh, yeah, absolutely. For everything, trying to make it as a real And this is like the possible. 70s and 80s, too, so this yeah. is like a pre internet era, right? So. Oh, yeah. He's really, no Wikipedia. Yeah, exactly. Tapped for the cover art of these immensely important titles was Jeff Easley. No greater proof of the struggle of doing this can exist than the fact that we haven't discussed Easley yet. Easley heard that his friend Larry Elmore was leaving Fort Knox to work at TSR. Easley was already doing art professionally for Marvel and Warren Publications working on comics, but he hated the constant networking and looking for clients of freelance work. He decided to follow his friend. He was hired in 1982. From pretty much the word go, he was off to the races, cranking out gorgeous artwork as fast as humanly possible to fill books that were being rushed out to print with reckless abandon. At TSR, he was allowed to show up late, work in one spot all day, and go home at five. Sometimes he had to come on weekends during especially tight deadlines, but he loved the flexibility and the freedom he was given. Every artist we've discussed so far has been ridiculously talented, and so please believe me when I say that Easley stands shoulder to shoulder with any of them. He did almost all the cover artwork for the AD&D source books because he could create unforgettably eye-catching artwork without even seeming to try. Easley would go on to work for TSR, then WotC, crossing over into the world of Magic the Gathering. Recently, he drew one of the posters for the D&D movie. He eventually moved back to Kentucky with Larry Elmore, where he continues to work as a freelancer, as surely one of the world's greatest living artists. With both books out and selling well, TSR had stabilized financially somewhat. The Bloom brothers agreed to an executive severance agreement. The Blooms claimed they agreed after Gary promised to buy their shares. Gary denies that that ever happened. The company passes on its first bid option to buy their shares. Later, Gary Gygax called a meeting. This story is told excellently in the article Ambush at the Sheridan Springs, which I have used extensively as a reference for the series. The short version is that Gary wanted to push for more royalties and for more creator ownership at TSR. That's a nice way to present it, but if that's what he wanted, he sure could have said so a decade ago. It seems to me that he wanted more creator ownership for himself. He wanted bigger royalties. The banks were squeezing him and his company. He ultimately jokingly posited, I might get better treatment if I wasn't an employee. He was chilled by how readily that idea was accepted. The company was days away from insolvency, and he was asking for a raise. In quick order, he realized why the Bloom brothers, who hadn't attended a single meeting in a while, were here. They'd exercised their option to get additional shares, and then sold all of those shares to Lorraine Williams. She was now the majority owner of TSR. She called a vote and was appointed as the CEO. Before the meeting had even begun, the bank-appointed board members had already sided with her. As much as I don't think Gary was the right man to lead this company, there's no way to characterize this other than an ambush. Gary Gygax had just lost his company to the woman he'd hired to manage it for him. Uh, Oh, that's wild. Yeah. Some very corporate drama here. (laughs) A lot of corporate drama. Uh Like, Um, I would expect to see that, like, mm -hmm. on one of those, like, corporate TV shows with the shocking music Yeah, exactly. And it just pans between the facial expressions, you know, of Mm -hmm. everyone in that moment. Gary tried suing, but it was no use. TSR had passed on its opportunity to buy the Bloom shares. The Blooms were within their rights to accept other offers. Gary resigned rather than hang on a second fiddle in his own company. This started a mass exodus of talent loyal to Gary. Frank Mincer and Kim Mohan left with Gary. Together, this trio of titans wrote Cyborg Commando, which was met with abysmal reception. By all accounts, it just wasn't a very good game. Mincer would float around for a few more years working on projects with Gary. None of them would fare much better. Kim Mohan saw the writing on the walls first. He went back to TSR. He had a family to support. I don't think anyone can blame him. TSR, meanwhile, needed to move on. In Dragon Magazine, there wasn't even a whisper of what happened. In the company, there was a desperate need for a new setting for TSR products now that Greyhawk's original creator was gone. They turned to longtime contributor to Dragon Magazine, Ed Greenwood. Ed had been writing articles for Dragon Magazine for a while. In each article, he talked about his homebrew setting, The Realms. A boss asked him, Do you make this stuff up as you go, or do you really have a huge campaign world? He answered, Yes. 
<laughs> TSR... <laughs> <That was> really funny. <laughs> yeah. TSR paid Greenwood just $5,000 and promised to publish his novels in their book publishing division. In exchange, he gave TSR something of impossible value, The Forgotten Realms. Baldur's Gate, the movie that just came out, Waterdeep, all of that is set in the Forgotten Realms from Ed Greenwood. Ed started writing the Forgotten Realms when he was a child. He started writing adventures and running campaigns in it in 1975. Some of his earliest articles in Dragon Magazine mentioned the wizard Elminster. He truly has always lived to create this world. It's everything to him. That's he's, actually, like, so incredible. The journey from, like, nope, it was just my little campaign. We're all yeah. Everything. TSR had just hit the jackpot. The Forgotten Realms became the main setting moving forward and was added to a rapidly growing roster of staple settings that would grow massively in the years to come. Ed Greenwood's production exploded. He worked with Jeff Grubb, whose own homebrew setting called Toril was merged with Ed's continent of Faerun, and the two together created the Forgotten Realms campaign set. Grubb said Greenwood would send him maps and documents and details of the Forgotten Realm wrapped in an absurd bundle of cellophane. His neighbor at the office always knew when an Ed Greenwood package had arrived because he would spend 15 minutes opening and loudly cursing. In one such bundle was a map of Waterdeep so big they had to hang it on the stairwell wall. Jeff Grubb said he once saw their published version of the map displayed at a bar. It was two stories tall. The book sales weren't explosive, but they did provide TSR Safe Harbor to set their future products in a world without such a strong attachment to Gygax. Ed's collaboration with Jeff Grubb is the start of a lengthy pattern of Ed's willingness to open his world up to others. He never seemed to jealously guard his world, and he's about to meet his longtime collaborator with a little help from the books department. If there was one department that TSR relied on time and time again to salvage its flagging sales, it was the books department. TSR was home to a rapidly growing stable of talented authors who produced a tremendous volume of high-quality fantasy work, and managing that growing roster in this era was Mary Kirchhoff. Mary Kirchhoff was a prodigious talent. She produced a huge quantity of novels for TSR. However, she frequently struggled to balance her massive responsibilities to TSR and her family. During this time, she married Steve Winters and had her first children. She helped fight to increase wages for writers and ensure better contracts and compensation for them, even as TSR's sales flagged. Eventually, she was too run down from writing books for five hours every night and then raising kids and then working a full-time job as an editor for TSR Books. She left the company and spent several years with her children. At one point during her tenure at TSR, though, she was looking for someone to produce a novel in the Forgotten Realms. Mary found a writer whose stories she disliked, but whose writing style she liked a lot. She hired this unknown talent directly out of the slush pile. A slush pile is a vast quantity of unsolicited work sent in by amateur writers hoping to get noticed. This individual was R.A. Salvatore. If anyone besides Ed Greenwood deserves credit for making the Forgotten Realms the default setting of D&D even to the day, then it's probably R.A. Salvatore. R.A. Salvatore was a Massachusetts native, and like many nerds of his generation, he was inspired by the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. As we discussed earlier, Kershaw hired him off the slush pile. He wrote his first novel for TSR in two months. That was just the kind of thing he could do. Bob, as he is sometimes called, was the kind of workaday author who could produce a truly terrifying volume of work. In his first novel at the last minute, Mary called him and told him that a character wouldn't work. Apparently, Drizzt was born off the top of his head, name and all. Mary asked if he could spell it. He replied, absolutely not. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, I've seen this character, I think. Drew Stewart? Yes. Oh, yeah, he's classic. He's, he's one of the most famous D&D characters ever. The idea of writing a good Dark Elf was quite radical at the time. D&D has often conflated race and alignment, but people love the classic fish-out-of-water character and the conflict of a man at war with his own people. This is a classic source of drama. His characters became famous and beloved rapidly, and soon he was one of TSR's most well-loved and respected authors. He also helped to establish the Forgotten Realms as THE D&D setting in the minds of his fans forever. As we approach the 90s, D&D has changed forever. Gygax is gone. Arneson is gone. Mincer is gone. Weiss and Hickman are gone. TSR now has to navigate what it means to make D&D without many of its original roster. The company was still reeling from years of mismanagement. There was still a bomb ticking in the background, and they had been publicly promising a new edition since 1985. Though they now had a new setting to center the game around, they needed to prove that they could make this game without Gygax. What they needed was a new edition. 
funnily enough, the way I recognize that character, because mm-hmm. I very much do live under a rock, is mm-hmm. the magic card. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we have made another AD&D character this week. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, this time it is our our good friend, Bokish. He's beautiful. Let's talk a little bit about what it was like to make it with Unearthed Arcana. Uh, we had another stat. <laughs> I feel like there's no way we could talk about this without talking about that, right? Oh. There's a seventh stat. <laughs> it's, um, it's my favorite. Uh, here it is. This is the only character sheet we could find with it actually on here. Comeliness. <laughs> what a name. Uh, yeah, so how'd you feel about comeliness? <laughs> um, well, cause so comeliness was basically like a character's, I guess, physical attraction. Because charisma is like how you can hold, I guess, um, not attention, but like, yeah. it's more, charisma is more like personality almost. It's like mm-hmm. they split up charisma from being just general, like, ah, this is a cool person. I mean, it's, it's so character like, and from, like physical. From the first moment they introduced this stat, they seem almost defensive about it being different <laughs> from charisma. Like they, they, yeah. they, they, they straight away go into, it's not charisma. It's not their different thing. Charisma like, too. Yeah. This is very much charisma to electric boogaloo. Um, Though, if you have a hide of comeliness, you uh-huh. cast the fascinate spell, I guess. <laughs> Which, you know what? As a wi- as a level one not wizard, yeah. you're called prestidigitators. So, um, I guess we do have to kind of own up yeah. real fast. Uh, yes. We were making this character for a very long time. We oh, had, yes. we had a It was a nightmare making this character. Because we every time we would get halfway through making a character, we would realize our stats didn't match up to at least one of the requirements for a class. Originally, and, the plan was to try to use one of the classes from the yeah, new, like, we were the new tr- Unearthed Arcana. Yeah, but we're doing this legit. We're rolling our stats, yeah. and so every time we would roll our stats, it would it wouldn't work we're for any of the new classes. Low. Yeah, and so what we ended up, but we ended up getting a magic user set of stats. Yeah. And we ended up getting really high comeliness. And so we thought, and well, charisma. This, mm-hmm. so we thought, well, we'll go with this. And then we ended up going with half work, but we never realized that half works can't be magic users until it was too late. And so we decided, fuck it. Fuck the rules. <laughs> We're just going to go was, with this. I think it was about like halfway through this character. Sheet yeah, we, we, we were very, very that. late in the character sheet. And we had already gone through two characters where we'd already thrown them out. Oh, yeah. It was a nightmare. And many more attempted stat. Yeah. After uh, we, we truly had a wretched time making this character. Uh, every the, time. I now understand why they said roll until you get at least two. What is it? Two fifty. Yeah. It was, that was in the rules somewhere. Yeah. Uh, so we actually, we made a magic user, but it's technically illegal because orcs can't be magic orc. users, but fuck this game. I want to say, <laughs> I half orc, I haven't used that yet. I but have, we actually did duel. follow all the other rules, including yeah. reducing our charisma because yes. we're a half orc. Now I still have, I still have the original yeah. rollings there because mm. I don't like that rule. And it also and reduced what? our comeliness yes. to fourteen. Yes. And is, it's not just that; it's um, as is charisma. Yeah. While not comeliness, does increase comeliness. Yeah. So if we had been <laughs> able to make our original, like with our original stats, without having the racial adjustments, we would have a nineteen comeliness. comeliness. Yeah. But because of this bullshit, we were lowered back down to a 14 and a 14. So I kept those other stats there because clearly my comeliness is so high <laughs> that my character would be able to convince anyone. This is your very comely stats. orc. Uh, yes. Looks straight. Looks he has no shirt. Very handsome. Um, these are your saving throws, which I love. Yes. I got really tired of writing things out. Yeah. So Um, the spelling bee for your spell saves. I forgot what that was. Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) Oh, it's not. uh, You need to move it over more in the. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's not on the screen. Yeah. Yeah, It's cut off. Here we go. The spelling bee. Yeah, I got really tired of writing them out. <laughs> I was surprised how high, mm. I guess, magic users have uh, breath I guess, weapon saves. Against, yeah. yeah, against breath weapons. Because that, oh, wait, or am I mis- mixing this up now? Is that supposed to be you have to roll low? No, high? No. No, it's lower. higher than. This is higher, higher than, yeah. than. Oh, okay, okay, gotcha. 
-hmm. So I have to roll higher than a 15 on breath weapon. Correct. So I'm worse at that. I always forget that because mm -hmm. whenever I... It's goal 3C and it's yeah. roll over for this. It's very confusing. Very bad Yeah, design. and it's also, it's like each individual character has their own, or, you know, each individual class has their own, like, saves against mm -hmm. dragon breath weapons. Like, I guess eventually that becomes, like, that's your con save. So you let's talk about... Number there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about this list because I thought this list was fun. We we actually got to roll a magic user, which meant we got to yes. go through the process of picking our spells. Which uh, where, what you do is you actually roll each spell, and based on your you intelligence, have a chance of knowing mm -hmm, it. Based on your intelligence, uh, you get a percentage chance of knowing each spell, and so you roll a d100 on each spell, and and those you succeed on, you can add to your spells known, and then there's like a maximum number of spells you can know. Yeah, and then, then from the spells you could know, you have to then eliminate... Well, that's that's something reach. we decided yeah. is how that works, because I don't yeah, actually yeah. know if that's how it's supposed to work. Um, well, I, I, would, yeah. I, would, I would imagine working it mm -hmm. that way, just because then you'd probably have... No, like, no one would know the spells at the bottom, right? If you're, like, yeah. going from top down. Mm-hmm. But uh, these are the end of, these are the spells you ended up getting. A lot yes. of ones you still recognize today. And uh, dancing lights and Yistil's magic aura is a spell in D and D still. Identify. Shield. I felt a need shield. for shield mm -hmm. as someone who is not allowed to wear armor. Some interesting ones like hold portal and erase. Yes. Uh, these are not spells any longer, but uh, pretty pretty entertaining. Um, and then you have your items down here. Yes. Because I couldn't buy armor or weapons because yeah. I'm pretty sure I read it somewhere that they could only use daggers and I couldn't find mm -hmm. it again. But I just kind of went with that. Yeah. So I bought a horse again. <laughs> <laughs> I got a riding horse and a silver mirror because if your comeliness is that high, you're doing a lot of upkeep, you know? As you do, as you do, you buy a horse. You know, we got no, can't get armor, buy a horse. <laughs> exactly. Might as well be able to go fast. Ride into mm -hmm. the sunset. That That's a part of my comeliness. Yeah. Um, I believe our strength got adjusted up because we're an orc. Yes, uh, we have like a minimum a 13 strength or something like that. Well, I think it was you get uh, a plus uh, one. I strength. see, I see, I got yeah. you. Mm -hmm. um, and then many other scores were then. Oh, well, con Constitution was also, I think, upped from. We had a pretty decent that. int. We had a pretty decent dex, uh, pretty decent con. Um, and yeah, pretty bad whiz, but not super important. Yeah. Uh, spell attack adjustment minus one, but I don't think that's going to really matter too much. Um, yeah. Funnily, funnily enough, even at the, the 14, the reduced 14 comeliness, that still falls in the, um, yeah, you the still category get the, for fascinate. Yeah, you still get the fascinate spell. You can still yeah. cast a magic on people with how hot you are. Yeah. Um, Which it was actually, I think it mentioned in the book too. Oh, to other half orcs, it's it's the it, like it doesn't. It's like reversed. Your attractiveness yeah. is reversed to evil people. So like evil people view a low number as high. Yeah. So, so evil people don't think I'm hot. Yeah, which is very strange because. Uh, they specifically make a point of like noting your comeliness yep. before adjustment in case you're like your people will see you as the actual yeah. uh, number. But then it's like actually better which is worse so it's yeah uh, confusing whatever very confusing mm -hmm. it was clear they did not necessarily want people playing half work yeah I, I, it definitely gave us the i definitely got the vibe that half work was it, a character it, choice against people's will yeah because like the, i mean it felt like at least for others there were like bonuses mm -hmm. but it's like it's like nope just just uh you know disadvantage 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 yeah for half orc uh so we're at the end of ad and d now uh so i guess this is a great chance for you not only to give us about this character but about the edition in general uh any final thoughts any final feelings I mean, addition in general, this whole time I've been like, I can't believe these these stat adjustments that mm -hmm. are happening, especially nowadays with like with, with Tasha's and being able to like make your own mm -hmm. character almost completely just like ignoring the Oh, yeah, all elves have like a plus this to dexterity. It's like, well, I don't want to be a dexter self. I want to be really bad at that. Um but for this one in particular, and I'm, I'm glad we did Magic User because I, I, I don't know in the future if we still get to roll for the chance of knowing mm -hmm. a spell. 
but from like a, a character making perspective like i've played i guess actually a lot of like mostly magic users like bards and well now a, like a warlock right mm -hmm. and i've played a sorcerer too in the past and you get to pick your spells you get to go through and say this is the spell i want but you don't you don't necessarily get to plan that out like mm -hmm. you can plan out a trajectory from like oh yeah i kind of want these spells maybe i'll take this one or that one when i level up that could be entirely thrown off because you could just roll too low to not know the spell oh yeah classic spells like magic missile we just yeah. rolled out of we couldn't even yeah. take them if we wanted to very well, i think uh, did i roll i think wait did i is magic missile on this list I don't remember. Uh, magic missile, yeah, struck through. Yes, Find and familiar, I didn't get it. Through. Yeah, we rolled too low in on large, that. anything that was struck through. Yeah, comprehend languages. Yeah, we we oh, sleep. Oh, and, one of the most yeah. like most powerful spell in this edition of the struck game through. struck through. Nothing. For for record on here also too, because um, some of those have two check marks uh, mm -hmm. on them. Oh, it's off the screen a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, but I, the one, I, yeah, I scrolled yeah. back out. Ones that have two check marks are ones that I quote now because we rolled on a d20, you know, just mm -hmm. did the math for I think it was like what 13 or seven or something like that. Um, but anything that I got two check marks on, it was anything that was the d20. And I had decided personally, if I roll a 20 on it, I'm taking that spell. Like, I'm not yeah. giving myself that choice and just to make it like more fun. Like, if you're going to randomize like what yeah. spells you could possibly know, I actually well like I actually like the idea of mm -hmm. rolling for your starting spell. Mm -hmm. I think it's actually kind of cool to have that randomized beginning. And then obviously you get to pick and train. I think probably if I were going to do it for mm -hmm. a game that I was making, I would have you roll for one and then pick another, right? Like, so you get yeah, that, like, so randomness, you... but you can still have a choice in how your yeah. game goes. Yeah. And then you could tie that back to like, oh, your whoever your mentor was that, mm -hmm. you know, started training you in magic. This was the first spell they taught you type of thing. Or, you know, whatever other lore origin, you know, thing there is Lorigen. Um, yeah, Lorigen. <laughs> um, but yeah being able to still kind of pick like okay that was the random one i got now here's here's what either something that works kind of cool with that that i maybe would not have considered before or mm -hmm. here's the one i want to use always and it's called magic missile <laughs> um, but i think the spells for sure was unexpected and i'm glad we went with a magic user uh, yeah me too I, i'm glad we got we got at least a magic user yes. in this era is that do you know is, is that still a thing is, is, if it's not too spoiler <laughs> i'm not sure actually i'm i'm i i i've only ever made like one character in second edition so mm -hmm. and i don't think they were a magic user so uh we'll, we'll see take a peek when we get there yeah we'll see next week um uh, okay, so we're officially done with AD&D now. We are Ooh. moving on to the second edition. We will not be spending as long in second edition as we did in first. Uh, we, we had like four episodes in first edition, but there were just so many cool people to talk about. So much stuff happening in the company. Um, and there's a lot to still talk about with second edition, but fortunately... Uh, we've covered some of the groundwork by by naming many of the important characters already. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be a lot easier to get through fourth edition or second edition because we spent so long in first edition. Um, so look forward to that, uh, hopefully. And then, other than that, uh, I think uh, you know we're entering an era where, for the first time, TSR is run by a person who does not play games. So it is a very different TSR coming up. And this is a woman who has been roundly and summarily villainized by the TTRPG community for 50 years. Oh no. Is deeply hated in the TTRPG community because she stole D&D &D from Gygax and blah, blah, blah. Um, and so... Going through the history of this era, I think, is going to be a real... Uh, for me, what I want it to be is an investigation into how it was actually run. Uh, because and obviously we know that this story ends with TSR getting bought out by WotC. So, yep. like, we know that things are not going to go great. <laughs> uh, but how do we get there? And was she as bad as everybody says? That's, that's what I want to examine uh, as we go forward. So yeah, I'll see you I'll see you next week as we as we dive into that. But until then, thank you for joining us and goodbye. Bye.